symposium. Uh, this uh, symposium will be for the first time will be held in Kolkata, India, and it will be held in the month of December uh, from 8 to 10. And uh, before that, in order to sensitize the scientists and researchers uh, among the, particularly in, the, in India and other Asian countries, we are organizing uh, a monthly webinar series. And uh, in earlier occasions, we had the speakers from Professor Suchikawa from uh, Japan, Professor Chung from Korea, and others from Thailand and India. And this will be the fifth uh, of the series. So uh, we hope that uh, the, uh, th those who are joining this webinar, uh, they will participate and they will uh, submit some papers in the, our ANS 2024 uh, in uh, December. Uh, now, so that's the background of this webinar series. So in the next month also, we'll have another webinar. And in um, most of the webinars, we are also getting one industry expert. But this time we have only uh, Professor uh, Kirsanov with us. So he'll be delivering uh, on the topic of uh, on medical applications of NIA spectrometry. Now, to just to introduce a very brief introduction about Professor Kirsanov, uh, he's uh, an acclaimed professor in, the, in chemistry uh, in, uh, at the uh, St. Petersburg State University. He's a professor and he has a, a long and successful track record in multi-sensor and chemometric research with a large number of publications in top international peer-reviewed scientific journals. And he is the lead scientist in the laboratory of applied chemometrics at St. Petersburg State University. His primary expertise is in the field of electrochemical multi-sensor systems for analysis of liquids or electronic tongues in short. And for the last 15 years, uh, together with his colleagues, uh, Professor Kirsanov has developed a number of novel sensor, uh, sensor compositions, having cross sensitivity and specially intended for the application in sensor arrays. In recent years, the team of Professor Kirsanov has extended their studies in the domain of UV visible and NIR spectrometry with special emphasis on online control of various industrial processes. One recent study of Professor Kirsanov uh, is on the application of NIR spectroscopy for qualitative analysis of urinary, uh, urinary stones. And all these uh, analytical methods require dedicated multivariate data processing tools, chemometric techniques. And this is where Professor Kirsanov has carried out extensive research. He has substantial expertise in machine learning techniques with applications in chemistry and related sciences. He has uh, uh, got several awards from uh, several uh, agencies. He was an invited professor at the University Lille One in France in 2013. He obtained that scholarship uh, in 2015 uh, to stay at Germany. He came to India also and, and, and stayed here with us for 15 days and conducted a course on chemometrics at Jadavpur University. And uh, he has got many, many other uh, awards. Uh, it, it, it will be a long list, I, I, I should say. And uh, so I, I think and this is enough what I've said about him. And he's a, a very good friend of us, uh, particularly uh, of our research group in India. And he loves to come to India. So <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we have not uh, seen him for quite some time. So I think with that introduction, uh, I, I welcome Professor Kirsanov, to please uh, present your uh, talk on this developing medical applications of optic fiber in IR spectroscope. Professor Kirsanov, the floor is yours now. Yeah, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bandiabarhai, for this very nice introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess I will go directly to presentation. I have nothing more to say uh, about myself. Yeah. After. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Please, please. Um, can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, now it's visible. Yeah, absolutely. No okay, great. So the uh, the topic of uh, this uh, talk will be devoted to the development of medical applications of optic fiber and IR spectrometry. Maybe it's formulated for now a bit broad, but uh, what I will focus on is uh, generally about intraoperative tumor margin assessment. 
and I will describe some case studies which we have done in our laboratory, mainly with the animal models, uh, but some of them are with uh, real patients. And uh, another example of this NIR application for biomedical research is uh, urolithiasis study, which Professor Bandia Parhai has mentioned. This is one of our recent uh, works in this domain. And here we were able to perform some in vivo experiments. And after that, we will go to some concluding remarks and so on. So uh, let's move directly to the topic. Uh, in the recent years, there are some new trends in the... Uh, uh oncological surgery and they are devoted to uh, what is called organ conservant treatment uh it means that when the tumor is uh, cut it out uh, cut out from the patient uh, the doctor aims to uh, keep as more uh, good tissues around it as possible so uh, this favors a lot the good recovery and quality of life for the patients. Uh, this is what is called organ conservant treatment. And for example, in Western Europe, uh, from 60 to 80 percent of uh, women with primary breast cancer, they undergo breast conservant surgery instead of radical mastectomy. So in former days, it used to be this radical mastectomy, when uh, which is more, uh, let's say, um, it brings more damage to the organism. And now uh, you see the proportion of those who uh, undergo this breast conservant surgery, it's quite large. So this is the trend. And uh, because of this, uh, because of this trend, uh, there is a need in the methods that would be able to uh, provide intraoperative tumor margins assessment. Uh, which means that during the operation, the doctor uh, needs to know where he has to stop his um, uh, resection, where he has to stop cutting. Uh, and uh, for this, he needs to distinguish, um, let's say, good tissue from a tumor one. And uh, just imagine if you are as, uh, if you are making a surgery, everything is covered with blood, and it's not that easy to do it, let's say, by a naked eye. Even if the doctor is very um, well experienced in that, it's not that straightforward. So uh, there is a need in some uh, instruments. And uh, just to highlight the importance of this problem, uh, for example, in the US, from 20 to 70 patients with primary breast tumor have to return to the hospital for tumor re-excision. Uh, this is because the tumor was not completely uh, deleted at the first step, and they need to go there back. And this also brings some uh, burden on the uh, health on the public health system and for doctors and for patients it's uh, definitely not good so uh, of course everyone would prefer to do it uh, once and <laughs> once and forever let's say so uh, what are the tools for uh, this uh, how we can uh, do this now uh, the most uh, well developed one is the tissue staining and uh, in this case you have to remove uh, this tumor tissue and it has to be uh, stained with special chemicals. And then in a microscope, the pathologist can uh, see the piece, this piece of tissue and can say if the doctor has removed the tumor completely or there are some uh, pieces of tumor uh, still remain or if there's a positive margin, which has to be two millimeters uh, according to the normal, uh, to the uh, modern prescriptions, if it if it really like this uh another uh way is so-called frozen section analysis it's when during the surgery a thin tissue samples they are cryosectionite uh, from uh, for further evaluation for the presence of these uh, malignant cells and uh, another one is microendoscopy. This is histology-like images, uh, but they are, what is good about this, they are real-time. Um, you can uh, make an acquisition of these images in real-time. And, and uh, it, it's good for the patients, actually. So what are the disadvantages of these uh, methods? Each one of them require the intervention of the pathologist. Uh, this means you have to have a special doctor who is trained to distinguish between these uh, uh, tumor cells and uh, normal tissues. Uh, you definitely need additional equipment, which is uh, like Creostat, for example, which is not available at many hospitals. Uh, 
it is time consuming and this is actually the most uh, dangerous thing about that just imagine uh, the patient is laying under the narcosis uh, and while he's uh, in this narcosis stage uh, the doctor has to wait for the results of this tissue stain, which can take like uh, half an hour sometime. And it's definitely not good for the patients to uh, stay in this uh, uh, state. And uh, all of them are bearing rather high costs for the hospitals, for the patients and so on. So uh, probably uh, a way out of this can be the use of spectroscopic uh, techniques. So what are the advantages? Uh, as you know, with the uh, NIR, for example, real-time measurements uh, using cost-effective and CPU equipment are po uh, possible, absolutely. Uh, if you perform the measurements in uh, diffuse reflectance mode, you do not perform any tissue destruction, which is also good. You can do it in uh, uh, online. And if you use the trained models to distinguish between tissues, you don't need a pathologist any longer. Uh, and the difference, uh, the way how you can distinguish between benign and malign tissue uh, or between uh, tumor and normal tissue, it is based on the difference in the metabolism. For example, uh, lipid and water content are different, which is uh, very well visible in NIR range. Uh, hemoglobin concentration can be different, uh, oxygen saturation level can be different, and all these factors, they have their kind of signature in NIR. That's why you can do this in principle. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, this topic was around for quite a long already, and there are mm, different papers with different combinations uh, uh, proposed for different types of tasks but all of them are rotating let's say around the same idea that using nir we can uh, distinguish in real time the tissues uh, <clears throat> and uh, we can determine this tumor resection uh, border and uh, this is fast and uh, doesn't require any uh, additional uh, doctors so uh, what could be the workflow for implementing this uh, procedure in uh, real life First of all, and this is unfortunately where most of the studies are end, it's a proof of concept uh, study. And normally they are based around some laboratory test with the uh, animal models because uh, due to the medical regulations and due to the larger, large bureaucracy around this, it's not that easy to get an access to the real patients and to real human samples. Uh, so you cannot just go to the hospital with your NIR device and say, well, let's measure something. It doesn't work like this, and you have to or, obtain the <clears throat> consents from the patients that they are ready to participate in this, and you have to <clears throat> uh, comply with all the requirements for the instrumentation which is allowed in the operation room and so on. So basically, this proof of concept uh, studies, the people are working with the animal models and they try to distinguish between cancer and uh, healthy tissues. And they uh, perform some statistical tests to find the uh, relevant spectral feature. Uh, then if this stage of proof of concept is successfully passed, uh, one can switch to this, uh, what I call close to real conditions. And this can be already in vivo experiments with the um, uh, aim to... Uh, check uh, your models and to check your uh, equipment in uh, real conditions. And uh, this may assume that you have to make some further developments of your instrumentation, like your uh, probe design, for example, uh, due to some uh, special regulation in the operation room, it, your original instrument uh, configuration can be not suitable for uh, working in the medical environment. And uh, what is also important here at this stage that um, except uh, besides this uh, cancer and healthy tissues, you have to include some uh, borderline uh, uh, samples in your uh, sample set. We will talk about this uh, later in more details, but this is important. Like in nature, it's not always black or white, not cancer or healthy. There are some samples which are in between. This can be a piece of tissue where cancer just started or has uh, didn't proliferate uh, too much. And you have also uh, to take these samples into account. Uh, then there is a large body of research around data analysis for these uh, applications. Because when you obtain this spectra, 
uh, in uh, uh, real conditions, there can be a lot of different contributions there. Uh, because the one thing, if you measure, if you perform your NIR measurements in the lab, where everything is fixed. And another thing, when you perform your NIR measurements in an operation room where uh, you can have um, some blood or some physiological solutions on your uh, probe and they will contribute to the spectra and you have to take this into account. And this is also a very important stage and a lot of research is going on there. Uh, then if it is, uh, if all these three uh, points uh, in the upper part of the slide are done, you can shift to design the probes uh, which will be compatible with uh, surgical tools because uh, surgery is a well-developed technological area and they have some uh, special standards for almost everything. And these standards, they are checked through the years and uh, no one will allow you to um, develop some new standard for your instrument. So you have to comply with what is already done. This means that you have to um, integrate somehow your spectroscopic probe into the existing uh, surgical tools you have to develop some disinfection protocols uh, because you cannot uh, because it's an operation room it's an open body operation and you have to develop this and uh, you have to develop a walking prototype and only after that you can switch to these clinical trials and uh, so far uh, there are not too many um, developments in this field that came to this uh, phase so all uh, what I will be talking about uh, later is on the very beginning. Some of uh, most of the studies are done here in a proof of concept, close to real conditions and data analysis. Uh, only some of them pass to this compatibility with surgery, and uh, maybe one or two are already in a clinical trial stage. And uh, if all of that was successfully done, you can switch to routine practice. This is the final goal of all of this. So uh, let us consider the first case. Uh, this is about Ehrlich carcinoma. And in this case, we worked with the uh, animal model. So these are the uh, laboratory mice, uh, and they are inoculated with the cancer cells culture. And uh, this uh, Ehrlich carcinoma, it is characterized by rapid growth. And this is why you can uh, track the development of the cancer uh, in uh, in vivo, but using the laboratory animal model. Uh, and uh, this is the design of experiment with some photos. We have this optical uh, fiber probe, which has a uh, four millimeter uh, diameter head, and it has some uh, optical fibers uh, that are carrying NIR uh, from the halogen, uh, halogen lamp. And some uh, one uh, fiber which is picking it up and brings to the uh, NIR spectrometer. So it is diffuse reflectance spectroscopy, and uh, we perform our measurements in this uh, range. So it's a real NIR, uh, and uh, average time for full spectral acquisition was just 15 seconds because uh, the mouse is alive during the measurements, and uh, when you perform your measurements. Uh, mm, heart is beating, blood is pumping, and there are a lot of um, uncertainties in this type of management. That's why we need some uh, such a long acquisition time. So uh, the objective here was uh, quite simple to see if we can distinguish uh, the normal uh, skin tissue from uh, that one which is uh, inoculated with cancer cells. And uh, uh, the experimental plan was like this. Uh, uh, first, uh, there was an inoculation stage, and then uh, they have this uh, tumor which starts growing. Then uh, there was the euthanasia uh, for the uh, uh, animals. And then we fixed uh, these uh, pieces of tissue in formalin and in paraffin. Why this is important and uh, what is the purpose of this? Because uh, in the laboratories, there is a huge library of these uh, materials. And if we can see that uh, we obtain the same results in vivo and uh, with uh, paraffin blocks, more or less, definitely they will not be the same because of the influence of paraffin and this tissue is not uh, alive any longer. 
but if we uh, uh, see that we can translate this uh, research from this paraffin blocks to the in vivo study somehow, that would be very nice because the, it will open the door for us to train our models with a huge available libraries of these paraffin blocks and not with the living animals. And these works, as you can imagine, they are much more expensive and much more uh, sophisticated. Uh, so that would be nice to check also if we can do that. Uh, here are uh, the first uh, examples of the uh, spectra that we uh, acquired and you see that in case uh, we have some uh, difference for the third day between the tumor uh, and between the uh, healthy skin, there are some different patterns and uh, what is uh, good for us in the paraffin block, we can also see some differences. Of course, the spectra change its shape a lot because of the contribution from paraffin. Here is the spectra of a pure paraffin, but still uh, we can see some uh, differences in this uh, spectra, and this is uh, really good for us. Uh, here are the PCA results for uh, obtained from these measurements, and uh, you can see that we have uh some reasonable separation for the third day seven day and ten day and even in formalin uh we still can distinguish between normal tissues and uh those with uh Ehrlich carcinoma uh which kind of uh, proves the uh, uh the concept and uh if we uh, go closer to paraffin uh, you see that it's still working but we have some uh overlap of these uh, classes uh, then we try to uh, apply different uh, classification tools uh, for uh, making the classification model because as you can uh, imagine PCA is not a classification tool, it's just a way to look at your data. <laughs> Sorry. And so then we switch to uh, some uh, classification like uh, support vector machines. and. Uh, we make this uh, depletion between calibration and independent test set and uh, we uh, calculate the sensitivity, specificity and false negative rate, which is the most important characteristic from a point of view of medicine, which means that uh, false negative rate uh, reflects the number of uh, positive cancer cases that were classified as uh, absence of cancer. And uh, of course, this is the most important one. We do not want to leave any cancer during the surgery. And we have to minimize this as much as possible. So uh, you see with the raw data and with the baseline removal, uh, we obtain uh, slightly different results. But basically, raw data suits better, and the explanation for this is because uh, the uh, intensity of the light scattering was different for these two types of uh, samples. And uh, in fact, this baseline shift uh, somehow contributes to the uh, leverage into the level up uh, the uh, two types of samples. Uh, what is important also for the surgery uh, is what is the uh, special resolution of this device. Uh, definitely it is determined by the head uh, size of this uh, NIR probe. And in our case, it was four millimeters. And with this four millimeter step, we uh, explored the uh, tissues in uh, uh, vivo and this uh, formalin blocks also. And we see that uh, we can uh, really obtain this type of uh, picture where we can distinguish from normal skin from a tumor and in case of tumor uh, this spectra looks different uh, and uh, this step uh, in terms of uh, space it's uh, four millimeter difference uh, actually now uh, we are working together with the producer of this uh, measuring devices and we are now switched to two millimeter head in our uh, measurements so it will be even even better it provides a better special resolution uh, another example is about uh, glioma and uh, again this was done with the uh, animal model these are were 56 red brain fragments uh, fixed in paraffin blocks and uh, some of them has this gliomas, uh, which is a tumor in the brain. And uh, the idea was, again, to uh, check if we can distinguish these uh, glioma fields from normal uh, brain uh, tissues. 
and all of them were histologically verified all the samples so we uh, again split the samples into calibration and independent test set and in this case you see that uh, the uh, this is the differential spectra brain minus uh, tumor uh, there is some difference but it is not that well pronounced and uh, on a pca score plot uh, the you know, two clusters are uh, significantly overlap uh, so we made different, we applied different classification methods in this case, and here you can see uh, how they perform. Here's the sensitivity, and here's the specificity. So in best uh, case scenario, we have sensitivity around uh, 85% and specificity above 95 with a linear SVM for raw spectra. And uh, if we remove uh, baseline, we can slightly increase the specificity up to um, 96, 97. But the uh, sensitivity remains almost the same. And uh, once again, the linear SVM was the best uh, model for this. And if we took the first derivative, we can further improve both uh, specificity and sensitivity. But in case of sensitivity, this impact is not uh, very dramatic. Uh, but for some of the methods, the specificity is almost around 100 persons. So this task can also be uh, uh done here's the, some statistics for different uh types and the best uh results were obtained here for the first derivative where we received the lowest false uh, negative uh rate uh another important task in this uh model uh experiments is uh, when your tumor is surrounded by a uh, normal skin or when your tumor is surrounded by different types of skin. For example, uh, around the tumor, you can have inflammation. So it's not a long, uh, not longer a normal skin. Uh, you can have some hyperplasia, you can have some papilloma, uh, which is a kind of a good type of uh, tumor. Uh, and the idea here was to distinguish between uh, four different types of uh, uh, skin samples. Uh, normal one, papilloma, inflammation and hyperplasia, and tumor. Uh, if we are able to do this, uh, this can really move us to the next level. So we can uh, not distinguish only between normal and uh, uh, unnormal, but also with between different types of uh, abnormality, let's say. So here are the spectra. You see they, looks, mm, they look quite similar, but there are some... Mm, a difference and if you put them on the same uh, PCA uh, you see that there are some uh, there is some overlap but the most distant class from all of the others is the tumor one which is definitely good for us so uh, we can switch to the pairwise comparison here uh, you see that normal and papilloma can be distinguished somehow uh, inflammation and papilloma are almost uh, indistinguishable here uh, there is reasonably good distinguish uh, between normal and tumor, and uh, tumor and papilloma are also well distinguished in a PCA score plot. So if we switch to the real classification using uh, SVM method, we can obtain this type of uh, results for one versus the rest. Uh, with these types of parameters, uh, you see that papilloma uh, is the worst case because it's somehow kind of tumor also, but it's a good, uh, uh, if, if I can say so, it's a good tumor. Uh, so it's really hard to distinguish them. They have very similar metabolism and chemical composition is the same, which leads to the similar spectra. And uh, also we can make a classification one versus one. Uh, in a pairwise classification, the results are somewhat uh, better. Uh, but once again, this uh, papilloma results for uh, inflammation for normal, uh, they are not very, uh, very good. Still, we have some way to, um, we, we still have some space for improvement here. But uh, anyway, you can do that. And uh, here is an example of the experiment with a human gastric cancer. And in this case, the materials were uh, nine patients from various types of gastric cancer. And we have these uh, 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 paraffin blocks after the uh, diagnostic surgery, uh, which means that uh, the purpose of the surgery was just to diagnose what kind of uh, tumor the patient has and to what uh, kind of treatment can be proposed for that. 
so we had these paraffin blocks, which were marked by a, a histopathologist, and we tried to make the spectral measurements using our uh, probe here. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one of the examples. Uh, this is the uh, picture of histologically verified um, a piece of this uh, tissue. And uh, it was uh, cut in kind of squares, four by four, according to the size of our uh, measuring head. And then uh, green uh, boxes are those which are normal, and red boxes are those which are considered uh, cancer by histopathologi histopathological study. And then when we perform uh, our uh, SVM models after the NIR measurements, we came to... Uh, this type of picture uh, and uh, in general we have reasonable uh, match with what was predicted by histopathology and you have to understand that uh, this is not a kind of uh, ground truth here because uh, people can also make uh, mistakes and if there is something here histopathologist may uh, take a kind of conservative view and decide that uh, this is a cancer and uh, he will assign zero. Uh, and in our case, if uh, the spectra are not that much different from uh, the library, it will be assigned as uh, not as one, but as zero. So uh, let us now switch to the uh, second uh, case uh, for NIR. This is Uralithiasis study. Uh, it's a very broadly abandoned disease, unfortunately, and uh, it is caused by the pathological growth of the solid concretion of mineral salts in the urinary tract. And uh, normally diagnostics is based on the symptoms and urine and blood uh, tests. And in most of the cases, low invasive surgery is the most common method for uh, the treatment for large stones. But uh, <clears throat> what is important that the relapse rate is rather high even after the successful treatment. This is why metathylaxis uh, of urolysiasis is uh, normally recommended to reduce the risk of uh, recurrence. And uh, according to the guidelines, stone analysis should be performed in all first-time stone formers. Uh, this is the map uh, showing the uh, proliferation of this uh, disease and the risk factors for this, uh, this dehydration, obesity, uh, infections or drugs, uh, hot climate, uh, genetics and different metabolic uh, disorders. So what types of urinary stones are uh, commonly found? The, the most uh, common one is the calcium oxalate stones which takes up to 80 persons, and here you can see the picture. Uh, then goes the uric acid stones. Um, they are often seen in patients with low uh, urine pH and uh, low urine volume. And uh, then uh, we have struvite, which is normally associated with some infections. Uh, and uh, the lowest percentage of uh, occurrence uh, goes for cysteine stones. Uh, why it is important to determine the type of the stone? Uh, because infection stones require additional antibacterial therapy and must be fully removed, uh, like in case uh, of struvite. Uh, oxalate stones require longer time for laser destruction when uh, the operation is in progress, so the doctor needs to know what type of the stone it is. And uric, uric acid stones can be postoperatively dissolved, actually, and uh, this is also important to uh, lower the burden on the patient. Uh, and uh, this is why it is to determine the composition as soon as uh, possible, preferably while the stone is uh, inside. <clears throat> Uh, what type of uh, qualitative analysis are available now? First of all, it's uh, X-ray phase analysis, but definitely you can do it, you can do it inside of the patient. Infrared spectroscopy and uh, polarized light microscopy. Uh, all of them are offline, uh, which means you have to first take the stone out of the patient, and uh, definitely they are not available in all the hospitals. Only some specialized labs can afford that. Uh, this is why. It takes quite a long time. Um, another method which was under consideration for quite a long uh, time, it's a visual inspection, but uh, the worst thing about it that the total accuracy is around 40% only, and uh, 
this was uh, this was calculated according to the meta uh, review of more than 300 different uh, surveys and it is not recommended as a reliable method and recently some uh, papers have appeared where they suggest deep learning to distinguish the uh, type of the stone according to its picture uh, of course it is good but uh, also associated with the need to uh, extract the stone from the patient and to make the photo in the standardized uh, conditions but uh, in general it shows uh, quite a good promise for that uh what are other uh options available and this is dual energy computer tomography uh it offers very high sensitivity and specificity but only for classification of uric acid vs not uric acid it doesn't suit for any other type of uh, stone and the uh, clinical use of this is limited by a very low availability and uh, another example is autofluorescence. Uh, it gives very high accuracy for oxalates and for struids, but it requires the simple preparation step. So you cannot uh, go with that into the hospital to do it in, uh, uh, inside of the patient. Uh, from the general consideration, NIR spectroscopy should be a good uh, possible option to do that because we have a wide range of fiber optic probes uh, that are compatible with surgical catheters. Um, the equipment cost is comparatively low. Uh, it offers in uh, this diffuse reflectance mode, it offers a non-destructive analysis and fast acquisition of the spectra. And uh, NIR can penetrate into the sample in, uh, for a depth of one, two millimeters. And if you look at the chemical structures of all of this uh, stone forming uh, anions and cations, you can see that all of them have the groups uh, that will give some fingerprints in... Uh, an IR region. And this gives us the chance to um, uh, distinguish between different uh, types of uh, stones uh, inside of the patient. Uh, so we performed a kind of feasibility study uh, for this project, and uh, it started with the collection of real samples. Then we perform measurements under ambient conditions in air, and then we perform measurements uh, in saline, because when the when the stones are inside of the patients, they are uh, in a kind of saline media. Uh, then we perform multivariate data analysis. And here we were lucky to go to the real intraoperative study. We had a chance to uh, check our technology in a real hospital with a, a real patient. So uh, here's the description of the collected samples. You see that most of them are calcium oxalate monohydrate, which is COM. Then we have some mixtures of COM and COD. It's a calcium oxalate monohydrate and uh, dehydrate. Uh, we have some uh, uric acid stones, and then we have different combinations of them. And uh, you see this group is the most broad one, and uh, together they made up like 90% of the whole uh, population. Only 60 persons uh, were of poor stones, so this uh, this is how these stones looks like, and uh, we have uh, in total 172 samples. And then we perform the measurements using this NIR, it's a, a light source, this is a spectrometer, fiber optic probe, very thin one, especially designed for this medical uh, measurements. And uh, we use a standard NIR spectrometer which works in this uh, range. Uh, and uh, these are the overview of the spectra, how they look like. This is the one from calcium oxalate monohydrate. This is uric acid, uh, apatite, uh, bruschite, struvite, uh, cysteine. And if you have a closer look, you will see that they have some difference uh, when you perform the measurements in the air. And uh, this gives us a chance to make uh, the uh, classification models for them. Uh, what is also important, uh, as you remember, some of the stones are mixed and they contain the mixture of, uh, for example, calcium oxalate monohydrate and calcium oxalate dehydrate. And uh, this mixture, uh, it is different from both uh, calcium oxalate monohydrate, which is black, and dehydrate, which is uh, blue and it is somewhere in between, which means that we indeed see uh, the chemical composition and the amount of uh, hydrated water in these uh, stones. And uh, we also perform measurements uh, for comparison in air and in saline, and uh, this brings definitely some contribution and distorts the spectra somehow because of this uh, saline media. 
but still uh, spectrum acquisition is uh, possible in these conditions. So if you go to the classification, to the, uh, not classification, sorry, for PCA under ambient conditions, uh, you can see that you have a pretty nice distinguishment between oxalates and uric acid. And also for some smaller groups, you can distinguish phosphates from struvite, from cysteine, but unfortunately, this is not very common and we have only one sample of this type. And well, also, as you can see, we have a limited number of samples of uh, struvite here. Uh, if you go for the measurements in saline, you still can distinguish, for example, calcium oxalate monohydrate from uric acid. These are blue and red uh, clusters here. You can make distinguishment between uh, monohydrate and dehydrate, green and blue, and uh, green and light blue, and you can uh, distinguish them from uric acid also. Uh, so then we switch to uh, classification models from PCA. Uh, once again, the samples were split into a uh, test set and uh, calibration, and we have 15 classes in total. Each composition is a separate class. Or if we go to um, uh, joining the groups together, uh, we can switch to 11 classes. If we, for example, uh, according to the chemical type, join together the uh, calcium oxalate monohydrate and calcium oxalate dehydrate. Uh, here are the numbers on specificity, selectivity, and accuracy of these classifications uh, for uric acid. Um, you see it's reasonably good. Uh, for COM, it's also not that bad. For a uh, mixture of them, it's also reasonable. And uh, if we uh, switch to saline, uh, it is still, I would say, acceptable for a first trial. It's above 80, which is uh, for such a simple method, which is suitable for uh, in vivo measurements, it, it can be considered as a good result. And then the, the final... Uh, Result that we have, uh, we had a chance to go for the operation and we inserted our sterilized fiber optic probe and uh, it is inside of the patient now. And then the doctor uh, was able to touch the stone with the head of our NIR instrument and we obtained the uh, spectra from the surface and then uh, shifting this probe we also obtained the measurement uh, from uh, let's say inside the stone uh, after it was uh, already extracted so uh, if we compare this spectra on the surface uh, we see that it corresponds well to the brush sheet uh, so which means that is some type of phosphate stone and after that this stone was brought to the uh, standard uh, x-ray diffraction analysis and it is say that it's uh, 72 percent of various phosphates so we were right here but it also contains some cod so uh, this shows us a very good perspective in our opinion for kind of um, very fast and uh, intraoperative uh, assessment of the type of the stones. Uh, so uh, some concluding remarks regarding these experiments. Uh, what we need to do further, we need to acquire a large NIR spectra database, uh, which are measured during the surgery, because the conditions there are different. You have this flow of saline through the patients, and this uh, makes its contribution of the spectra. We need to understand whether our models are good or um, all the accuracies because the axolite stones are naturally prevalent. As you, uh, as we discussed, the, uh, the percentage of these oxalates is up to 80%. So maybe the only reason why we can distinguish them so well is that we have a lot of them and not too many of the other types. And uh, uh, we need to eliminate this influence of the permanent saline flow in front of the detector head. And uh, we also need to answer the questions how many levels in our classification we can achieve. Should we go to this 15-class uh, classification to include all the types of the stones? Or maybe we can combine some of the classes together. And uh, another important question, the stones inside of the patients, they are really heterogeneous. And uh, one stone can contain different chemical phases. So how this will affect the results? We need to perform the measurements in the different points uh, uh, in this stone. So all of this is uh, makes uh, a long way to go for us for a real uh, routine application of this. But uh, the results we have so far are quite 
promising. So basically, I think this is all I want to tell you about our experience with the uh, NIR. And thank you very much for your attention. I will be glad to answer uh, your questions if you have any. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Professor Kirsanov, for your excellent lecture. And it was really very lucid and to be good to understand almost, I think most of the, uh, I mean, uh, students and the other researchers here, they could understand and uh, the presentation very well. Uh, yeah, if uh, any questions from anybody, I have some. Uh, let me uh, get some questions from others. Uh, anyway, then I, I'll, I'll start. Uh, let uh, some other person uh, let them think for some time. Uh, see, my, my question is that see, uh, the surface that you have uh, explored that surface is not at all even. Uh, it's very uneven surface and all that. And exactly. uh, so, so that uh, really is a, is a major problem for uh, NIR. So uh, is, do you think that this data processing techniques that you have used, uh, for example, this baseline and this uh, Savitsky Gole, that will uh, solve this problem or any any other uh, issues that there? No, actually not really. Uh, before you switch to these data processing tricks, you first have to acquire the spectrum, which is good. And uh, for this, what we see in this uh, intraoperative uh, case when we went to the hospital, the doctor, uh, he has to uh, pick up a proper position to acquire the spectra first. Uh, he was touching the stones in different places before we can even see the spectra. So this is the real problem. And uh, in some cases, we can imagine that the surface of the uh, stone can be so um, uh, as we... Let me show you some. Yeah, this one. Uh, you see, some of them are very has very well uh, developed uh, surface with a lot of uh, let's say caverns and things like that. Uh, so with your probe, you need to uh, come to some point where it is more or less flat. And in some cases, I believe it will be hardly possible to find this. That's why you need to touch the stone inside of the patient and to try to find the proper point for the measurements. And uh, only after that, you can switch to this um, uh, kind of noise reduction and base like reaction and things like that. So first of all, you have to find the appropriate place for the measurements. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but definitely this is this will really be a game changer if you if this NIR spectrum uh, spectroscopy can be used for this type of uh, assessment, and that would be excellent. You know, we have to uh, we can eliminate many other expensive methods. You know? We hope one day it will be there, but still, uh, well, frankly speaking, still NIR is uh, at least in Russia it is still rather expensive for most of the hospitals because this uh, urinary stones treatment uh, it, it it's a kind of uh, ordinary operation and it can be performed in many hospitals in Russia, but uh, not all of them will be able to afford uh, the modern yes. NIR spectroscopy. spectrometer. That also could be a problem. So, of course, we say it is cheaper than this uh, XRD. Uh, it's true, and it's cheaper than this tomography. Yeah, yeah. It's true, exactly. but still, uh, we still have a long way to go. And I have another question. Uh, in it, it, it may be a very simple question on NIR. Uh, it's that you have used a, a certain portion of the spectra instead of the whole spectrum. And in slide 12, uh, I could see that uh, the results uh, are better when you are using, uh, uh, I mean, a certain, uh, uh, only a certain portion, not the, uh, worse than the uh, when you take the entire spectra. Is it due to the uh, noise part, or if you can just? Uh... Uh, what do you mean? Ah, yeah, here, uh, yes, yes, we, we we cut them because uh, there are some parts which are not informative, especially not in this, in this visible range. Uh, they are not. Uh, we check they do not bring any uh, useful information from our, for us, neither in PCA nor in classification, so they are just not shown. It's it's a kind of noise here. Right. Mm -hmm. And the last question from my side is that you have used that's four millimeter square uh, skin uh, for this uh, mice uh, measurement, no? Uh, uh, in case of urinary stones, no. It was a, a smaller one, and the mm -hmm. diameter of the head it is especially designed for the medical to, to fit with the medical catheter, 
uh, which is a standardized uh, surgical uh, surgery instrument. Okay. 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 And uh, okay. the whole diameter, I think, uh, the whole diameter is about maybe two millimeters or something. Uh, so it's a really, a really thin stuff. But uh, the NIR, that uh, fiber optic group, the diameter will be of the order of 500, 600 microns. No, uh, what, what, which diameter you are uh, using? Uh, I, I, I can check with uh, the specification. I, I don't remember by heart now. Sorry, but uh, yes, it's really thin. Yes, it's really. Yeah, thin. yeah, yeah. Because what we are using here in our laboratory from the Thor labs, we procured some uh, fiber optic probes. The diameter is 600 micron. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's difficult to get the diameter more than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so that yeah. So, so uh, the fiber probe that we are using, we are uh, we bought it from uh, one company in Moscow here in Russia, and they are kind of specialized in the uh, in doing this. Uh, um, okay, okay, okay. Probes yeah, that are compatible with the surgical instruments. Mm -hmm. No, our understanding, I'm just asking you, our understanding is that if you can have a larger diameter fiber optic probe, then the performance will be more because more light will be there. And what of is course it will idea? be, but if it will be, if it will have a larger diameter, you cannot fit it into the surgical instrument and you cannot <laughs> fit it into the patient. Because you see uh, here, it's a kind of a small uh, invasive operation. We do not, uh, the, the patient is not cut. There is no surgical cut. So uh, we only insert the catheter inside. Uh, and uh, this is why we are so uh, demanding for this diameter. We, you cannot make this uh, uh, device larger. Uh, otherwise, it will not fit into the inside of this catheter. Yeah. And uh, in terms of spectrum, uh, yes, of course, more light will uh, be there. The spectral quality will increase. But the, this is something uh, kind of uh, yes. straight here. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. That's all from my side. Any any other uh, who are there in the audience? I, I can still see more than twenty five um, students and researchers are there. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Sir, the, my first question is is that what is the wavelength range detector you are using? It's the uh, 900 to 1800. Uh, you mean the spectral uh, range? Uh, yes, yes a spectral range. Yes, it is from 900 to 1800, right. Uh, it, so it's, a, that, that, it's, a standard, it's a standard range for this uh, spectrometer. Mm -hmm. I am repeating the same question that that the admission was asking that you are initially wavelength region something like that. You are starting from nine hundred forty to around seventeen hundred. So you are removing some initial portion of the wavelength and the last portion for the noise purpose only for the noise purpose or something else. Uh, no, only for the noise purpose, and uh, it was not informative in our studies. So maybe for some other application it could work, but here it was uh, it was not useful. Why why to consider it? We just remove it. And the, the second question is that is there any specific wavelength region that if you took that some specific regions for the, instead of taking the whole wavelength region, it will be better. Uh, what what kind of region do you have in mind? You mean to go further in into the uh, uh, IR? No, 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 no. In the not taking the nine hundred to seventeen hundred. Suppose it's can be fourteen hundred to. Uh, you mean to go to like the visible to, 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 to the visible range, right? Uh, no, uh, I, l no, let me explain. Uh, let me, uh, Dilip, I, I'll explain the question. Yes. Um, his his question is that instead of taking say from uh, 950 to say uh, 1600 or so uh, it, uh, is it will it be better if you can take the uh, specific spectra say for um, uh, for say blood or in, in any other type of uh, formalin or any other uh, compound uh, so for, for 15 um, nanometer 15 nanometer or 100 nanometer so that will be more specific no what that's his question uh, 
you mean to increase the resolution, the spectral resolution? Yes, or... yes, yes. Uh, well, probably it will be, but we have to we have to check for each particular task. Uh, you see here the pro the main problem is not with the spectral resolution, but the main problem is that when you're measuring in saline, uh, it's it, you are kind of performing measurements in a flow in liquid, and uh, uh, this liquid flows between the head of the detector and the stone which you need to measure. And uh, the spectra depends a lot on the light scattering of everything, and you need to uh, find that proper point first uh, to uh, minimize all of this uh, flowing. Uh, resolution can definitely help, but I think it's uh, in okay, this okay. particular case, it's not the main issue. Okay, okay. I, I, I think that clears the point, Dilip. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Then I have another question, not for this presentation. So if you can remember that, then I can ask that. It's, a, it's, yes, it's your, yes, yes, it's your, your paper on NIR and also electronic tongue for the correlation of pharmaceutical product. It's a parasitical formulation. So if you can allow, then I can I ask one question. So, uh, which particular one about the dissolution test or? Distinguish, distinguish the title of the paper is distinguish Parasitamol ah, yeah, formulation. Yeah, distinguishing paracetamol formulation, yes. Uh, comparison of potentiometric electron stem with establishment of energy techniques. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I remember it, that one. I can. Uh, yes, I, yes, I, yes, I, yes, I, yes, 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 yes. So, so in the in this study, you have compared the NMR, NIR, IR, and ETA. This first mm -hmm. comparison you have made. So in the same the, the same I am doing the same question, for because I am trying to. Develop a model to estimate the quality of paracetamol. So you, mm -hmm. using this um, wavelength, whole wavelength region that it's 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 in your paper. It's the uh, here you are using the same wavelength, the 900 to 1700. So mm -hmm. my question is that is, will be it benefited or something like that if if we use some specific wavelength. Or, um, not, you know, whole I don't I, I don't think so. It depends on the particular task you are uh, trying to solve. If you are aiming at uh, quantification, let's say, of the paracetamol in some pharmaceutical formulation, this can yes, work. Yes. If, you, if you fix the particular wavelengths where you have the maximum of information from paracetamol. But uh, we were aiming at a kind of general classification of the uh, tablets according to their production uh, country. And in this case, the more wavelengths we have, the better. Um, so it really depends on the task, I think. Uh, if you know that paracetamol, uh, let's say, absorbance happens at one particular wavelength, uh, mm -hmm. You can go there, and if your task is to quantify yeah. paracetamol. But if you switch to some uh, kind of general classification, you have to, I think you have to use the whole spectrum. And that last question is that if you only use that two preprocessing method, one is SNB and fast derivative, is that any specific reason choosing these two specific preprocessing or just for the comparison or result? Uh, actually, we used uh, different uh, types of preprocessing, and this this uh, this works. Um, these two methods works better. That's why I have uh, only shown them. But we tried other methods as well. Uh, okay. So we, uh, always it's a question of trial and uh, error regarding the preprocessing. I do not know any kind of universal risk type to to choose some preprocessing. It's always <laughs> different than they are. <laughs> Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Dilip. Thank you. Uh, in, any any other questions? I think uh, it's more than an hour, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Dimitri is talking. Mm. So uh, I think we can uh, conclude our session today. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if there is any other question, uh, you can send directly to me. You can send the questions to me, and I can definitely forward. And to Professor Kirsanov because he is really, uh, I mean, uh, his his knowledge, particularly in chemometrics, I know uh, very well because he actually taught us this chemometrics at Jadhav University a few years back, and we learned a lot from him. So students here, you can definitely uh, get a lot of input from him if, if you need. So in, anyway, uh, so on behalf of uh, Jadhav University and the organizers of this ANS 2024. 
uh, let me thank Professor Kisanov for your uh, excellent presentation, particularly in this upcoming area that uh, actually we, I was really uh, excited to look into the title of this talk. This will definitely, uh, because I'm really a, a fan of NIR spectroscopy. And I feel that if this type of solutions can be used for this type of critical applications, that would be wonderful. So with all our best wishes to Professor Kisanov, and we'll definitely be in touch with you. Uh, if we can also work with you in, in hey, future. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, 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 if it is possible for you to come to Kolkata and during ANS 2024, you please look into the possibility. <laughs> we'll also see if something can be done from our okay. side. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, um, Professor Kisanov. Uh, uh, let's conclude the session today. And thank you okay. to all, all, all the others who are present during the session. Thank you. Mm. Bye. Okay, okay. Bye-bye then. Bye-bye. Yeah.